Okay, it's Sunday, which means against my better judgment, it's time to go on Reddit and see what questions we can dredge up from this hive of scum and villainy with the cat, special guest, at least for now. He doesn't usually like to hang out when I'm actually talking, but he's decided he wants to be here for now. Isn't that right? Good talk, good talk. So, May actually works at range now. Yeah, May's actually, like, kind of annoying as a result of this. It makes it a lot easier for to charge up Blizzard, because she just kind of gets to do damage from quite far away. Her projectile is also really fast, like there's the delay where she initially loads it, but then the projectile itself is really fast, so it's not that hard for her to actually hit somebody. And now it actually does damage very far away, so that's kind of spooky. And, uh... I've been killed by a May from across the map enough times to be annoyed by it, is the gist. But it's very... The fact she gets to build a blizzard quite quite fast is quite strong. Does anyone else struggle to hit Anna? Maybe I'm just bad for some reason, but I really struggle to hit Anna's over fucking fly. Anna's over any heroes, any other heroes. Mercy, Widow, Lucio, all easier for me to hit the kill than Anna. It's like her hitbox is smaller than it appears and is generally oddly shaped. It is oddly shaped. You're right about that because she's hunched over. But I've never really had that issue before. If anything, I find Anna is usually easier to kill than most people because it's quite easy to headshot her because she's hunched forward. So her head is sort of on the front of her model. But I don't know. Get good. Aim better. New set player stat sites for testing. Well, let's have a gander, shall we? See what we got. Search. Oh, no. This is an image. This is not actually up here. <laughs> so, let's see what the stats are like. Uh, uh, uh. It's so easy to remember because it's the easiest number in the world. All right. What we got? I haven't done anything this season yet, though. Um, that's okay, it's good enough, apparently. Let's see, this is basically the same as overbuff. Um, yeah. This is just overbuff with, like, less stuff on it, so, I mean... It works, I guess, you know. I, I pimp it regularly. Let's pimp it one more time while we're here. The, not this one. I like to use Coder Watch. That's what the URL is. There it is. Because it does the work for you. You don't have to actually interpret anything on the stats. It just looks at your stats and goes, Oh, look, you're really good at healing. Target priority? That's eh, kind of shit, though. Maybe work on that one. There goes the cat. So, oh, no, nope, that's some uh, a video for later. So, uh, I like that one just because I have to do less work to use the website, basically. But, you know. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't seem out of control good. How to improve my aim? I mean, so, you just play a lot of oh my god that's so low this madman um two five six uh, yeah yep yeah, mm-hmm mm-hmm i mean the thing is all you can really do is just practice a lot there's not real there's there's aim is the one thing people always want a shortcut to there's no shortcut to it it's one of those things that you just kind of have to get over there are certain things in all all aspects of life, but with competitive gaming, there's like some things there's no shortcut to, and aim is one of them. It's just lots and lots of practice. And, you know, it sucks as well, because it doesn't feel like something that's ever improving, right? It's just eventually at some point you look back and you go, oh shit, I've gotten a lot better at aiming actually, but it's very hard to notice the incremental improvement over time. And it's just one of those things. It's like if you're trying to get good at, like, a fighting game or something, you just have to get dunked on for a few hundred games before you even know how to remotely play the game, and that's just something you have to, like, power through if you really want to, like, play that kind of game, right? This... <sighs> I've played 
like 3,500 games of fighters, and I've almost gotten a 50% win ratio at this. I'm very close. I'm at like 48%. I'm almost there. But the servers have been down for a week, so it's very upsetting. It's, it's just one of those things. You have to, like, power through it. You have to be bad at aiming, and eventually you get good at aiming. It just sometimes it takes a long time. There's no shortcut. Is it just me or is diamond ten times easier to climb than, than in plat? Yes, platinum is the uh, uh, the upper end of platinum, like 270, uh, 207, 2750. Christ, numbers are stupid. 2750 up to diamond are the worst SR to climb out of easily. Because that's where people have generated enough ego that they don't want to change heroes. So you at that... But they're not good enough at those heroes to actually carry. So this is where you'll find the people that are like, I should be in Diamond, it's these scrubs that are holding me back, so I'm going to pick Widowmaker and hard carry. Then they proceed to not hard carry, and we got four other DPS on the team. So that's where that's most likely to happen. It's terrible. It's awful. Anyway, trouble maintaining muscle, mouse muscle memory. Maybe this will help. Um... I mean, if you're switching between mice's, mouses, you know, that that does make it harder, which I think is the crux of this. Like, you know, whatever. It's not an issue I've ever had, but then I don't switch between mice very, very often, so. Good single-player party-based RPG that approximates Overwatch. Um... For a buddy to learn party-based fighting mechanics. What a weird question. Um, kind of reminds me of a conversation I was having with a friend earlier where we were talking about how in Overwatch um, XCOM style game would be pretty sick. But, you know, that's not something that will ever happen, probably. Uh, fuck, that's such a... That's such a very specific question, isn't it? Um, RPG games to learn party-based fighting mechanic dynamics. I, I guess some maybe something like Mass Effect, because they're sort of turn-based, like, in the, they're sort of turn-based in the extent because you kind of can micromanage what your teammates are doing, and you can pause the game and, like, select all their abilities and stuff like that. I mean... So like that, something like that comes to mind immediately. We got any good suggestions in here? Uh, you should have asked that aspect down. Trading kills, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mass Effect or Dragon Cat, yeah, yeah. I mean, Dragon Age, same thing. Xenoblade, never played. Monster Hunter, not really. Monst you can kind of just do your own thing in Monster Hunter, and like that's fine. Um. Pretty much every enemy has different mechanics and forces you to plan out your attacks while knowing what your character's class is good at. Yeah, but it's not really, like, party-based or anything. Like, like I mean, it is literally party-based, but it, it's not a big thing, really. It's such a weird question. I really don't know what to say. If you got a better answer, good on you. I don't know. Mass Effect or, like, Dragon Age is about the best I got. That's such a weird question. Definitely haven't seen one like that before. Oh yeah, they're increasing the avoider's teammate limit to three. Honestly, like, whatever. I don't really use it that much. Um, occasionally I do, but mostly, like, here's here's the here's the dirty truth: is that I'll mostly use it just because if somebody on my team is bad, I'll put them on avoid teammate, hoping they're on the opposite team in the next game. That's what I do. Um. Very rarely is it used for its intended purpose of just, like, avoiding assholes, really. I like, I mostly use it to try and increase my own win rate, because I'm a dirty, underhanded cheat like that. New to PC, really struggling in terms of survival. Uh, I play, tried Overwatch on PS4 during a free win, Impulse bought it after getting play of the game on my first match. I got play of the game on my first match as well, but I was playing Reaper, and it was the day the game came out, so... I just kind of, 
You know, I remember it very vividly as well. It was on Sanctum on Nepal, and what happened was about as basic as you can possibly get. Got my ult, dropped down in the large health kit room, walked up behind the point, spanned behind the enemy team, and killed five people. Easy peasy, because they didn't have a tank either, because it was the first day Overwatch came out. So, good times. Um, now, that wouldn't have been when the game came out. That would have been one of, during one of the beta weekends. Um... One of the the few open betas we got. Whatever. Anyway. Uh, dropped $75 on loot boxes. You're part of the problem. Played until level 16-ish. Uh, because I felt like I've better be better playing a p shooter on PC due to precision mouse control. Correct. Uh, because nobody else ever seemed to play healer. He was the only healer I remember. Okay. Great. Uh, I found out Overwatch was 50% off on PC, got the Legendary Edition, returned to semi-glory days with relative ease, but I'm having a really hard time, no matter how I plot I play, I feel like I'm dropping at the slightest graze, even though my most accurate blows are merely making a scratch. Seriously, I was playing 1v1 duel mode tonight, both me and my opponent getting a Zenyatta at some point. Hit him a few times, but he survives and kills me, I pick a tank, he gets Zenyatta, I was basically insta-killed, what gives? I'm really struggling to adapt PC controls, often forgetting what button does what a mo. That's kind of a big deal, such as forgetting left shift even exists, accidentally hitting my ultimate button when I mean to press left shift. You better have rebound that to something different, because I'm just trying to imagine accidentally pushing Q when I meant to push left shift. Like, I use a completely different finger to do that. Forgetting melee is even a thing. And the like, I'm getting a few. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, so. Before Sombra and Onward were released, so I have no idea how any of them work. Okay. Well, General, t I mean, so. The, the, the brutal answer is just play the fucking game more. Like, you just haven't played the game that much. Like, you just kind of have to play it and get used to it. And anything like. So, the thing is, the, with competitive games in general, is that a very important aspect of the game is being comfortable moving around in the environment. If you can't do that, then it's hard to do much of anything else. Survival particularly ties to this, seeing as survival is usually related to positioning, which is tied so integrally to movement. So, you just kind of have to be comfortable controlling your hero and navigating in the space, and until you do that, you can't really get very much else done, really. It's a pretty, like, key aspect. Um, this is something that I had to learn recently, playing fighting games again, because the first probably, like, 500 games I played, I wasn't comfortable moving around properly. I didn't know how far a dash was going to take me. I didn't know how high a jump was going to go, so on and so forth. And as a result, because I couldn't do something on demand, like land on the ground and dash as soon as I landed, because I wasn't comfortable moving around, stuff like that led to me just getting dunked on quite regularly. But then, eventually... Got comfortable moving around in the environment, got used to, to the controls and everything, especially since I'd never played a fighting game that seriously before. And then eventually, like now, 3,000 games later, hey, I can move around pretty comfortably, and I can move, I can dash and move around on demand, and now I know how high my jump's gonna go and shit like that, and it's a lot easier now. Um, all games are like that. You need to get used to moving in the environment before you can start getting much else done. And then the other thing is, with a hero-based game, is you need to know what all of your opponents are going to do. So, if, like, before Sombra, so a lot of heroes now, like, you don't know what they do. And it sounds like you didn't play that much beforehand either, so I'm guessing don't have an exactly intimate knowledge of what each hero does and how they do that and what their, all their abilities do and stuff like that, so, which is another important aspect of anything hero-based, really. Because you need to know what the enemy is going to do to be able to play around it. Because if you don't, like, if they're just a fucking mystery box walking around the map, right? You don't know what's going to come out of them. You don't know how they're going to move, stuff like that, you think? You're gonna, it's gonna be really hard for you to predict what they're gonna do and survive if you, just, you don't know what they do. So you kind of need to learn what all the heroes do and then get used to playing around all of them. Because uh, that's turns out knowing what your opponent can do and is likely to do is important information also. 
um, so, you know, just, just play the game more, is, uh, what a long-winded, what a long-winded explanation to get around to just play the game more, but I think it's important to know why it amounts to just play the game more, like, you just need to learn important, basic aspects of the game, basically. Um, versus wrist aiming, I, I don't give a shit about all that. I, I aim with my wrist, and that's all I know. I don't go too deep into that shit. Dying too much, not having enough impact in comp. So I'm high gold at the moment, and I've only played re I really played about 30 games of comp at all. Up, I mainly play DPS. While playing DPS, sometimes I struggle to make an impact. I have really good aim and have carried many games, but I always find myself dying way too much and having less impact than I feel I could have. But then if I play too passive, I don't get as many picks. Is it my positioning? Like, how should I improve? That's a very vague question to ask without further details, really. Um, so, I play very aggressively, also, and this leads to me dying sometimes as well, because I've overestimated how much I can get away with. However, I do recommend playing as aggressively as possible while trying to learn, because... That's how you end up getting a really good feel for what your character's limits are. Most people, when they're learning or trying to improve, have a tendency to play too passively. And while playing passively is never really going to lead to you having disastrous results, it does lead to you not taking advantage of as many opportunities as you were given because you, were you weren't in a position to take advantage of them because you were playing too cautiously. So I do recommend just playing as aggressively as possible. Um, the important thing, though, is that you learn from each time you died, because that's, like, just running into them and suiciding over and over again isn't productive. You need to actually then sit down and go, okay, why did I die? And there's two important questions to ask whenever you make a mistake, and the first question, the, okay, it's one question with two possible outcomes. English is a stupid language. And it's, did I fail mechanically, or was it a bad decision? So because if it was a good decision, but you failed to execute it correctly, then, you know, whatever. You just try and execute better on it next time. But you do have to decide, you do have to figure out if it was a bad decision to begin with. Because if it was a bad decision, you gotta remember that the next time you're in a similar situation, so you don't make the same mistake again. So I do recommend playing as aggressively as possible. You just have to learn when you die and overstep your boundaries. And then you go, all right, so why did I die right there? Was it a good decision to go in right there? No, okay, it wasn't. I, there was no way I feasibly get away with what I was trying to do right there. So next time I won't do that. And then next time you don't do it, you play a little bit less aggressively, but you end up getting a really good feel for where your boundaries are, both as a player and on the hero you're playing, because... I mean, if you're if you're an aggressive player by by just because that's how you are as a person, then you gotta play aggressive to really take advantage of that. Everybody plays the game slightly differently to each other. Everybody has different tendencies. So if you're inclined to play aggressively, go ahead. I recommend you do that anyway while you're trying to learn. Just make sure that you when you make a mistake and die, ask yourself why you died, and then learn from that mistake. But fuck man, just play really aggressively and then Every time you die, why did I die? Was it a bad decision or did I execute badly? And then adapt accordingly. And then eventually you'll die less. I do think deaths is the only stat really worth tracking because the other stats can lie to you, basically. Like damage done, eliminations and all that. Like what is a good mark for damage done and eliminations and accuracy and everything like that varies from game to game. Because if I'm playing McCree, and the enemy team is like quad tank, then me having 60% or 70% accuracy isn't really all that impressive because they're, the enemy team is so easy to hit because they're full of tanks. Whereas if the enemy team is like four flankers, then me having 40% accuracy suddenly actually becomes pretty good because their team is full of people that are hard to hit. So... You know, and similarly, damage can lie to you in the same way, because if they've got fucking quad tank Mercy An or Moira Anna, then me ha me doing like 20k damage to the at the end of that game might not really be all that impressive, because I could have just sat farming Roadhog the entire time, couldn't I? So, 
stats like that can lie to you. You have to do a lot of like actual interpretation to figure out if what if the number you have is actually good or not relative to the game. Whereas deaths just directly ties into how much impact you had on the game. Because every time you die, that's like 10 to 30 seconds of the game, you just had no impact at all in. The more time you spend alive, the more time you spend interacting with the game, and therefore the higher your other stats will be by extension, and the more opportunities you're in a position to take advantage of, and the less opportunities you present to the enemy team, because most opportunities are based off somebody dying. So I think deaths is the only, de and only st stat really worth tracking to any significant degree. Um, anyway, that was a really long and meandering answer right there. We're 20 minutes-ish into this video already, and we've answered like two actual questions, and they basically amounted to get good, you scrub. What a day it's being so far. That's why I don't take like two days off, right? You know, because then you come back to work and fuck, you suck. You just suck. It's not my fault, I had to get up mad early, and then as a result, that led to me going to sleep mad early the next day. Okay, look, that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. I've been stuck in Platinum since Season 3 in 2016. Played since launch, I've been watching Jane streams, uh, reviewing my VODs, posted several posts here, but nothing seems to help. I dipped into Diamond before, but never won a single game there, and fell right out. I'm a tank main, I flex if I need it, and I think I'm sorry, stuck in Plat. Um, so we got stats here to look at. So we're going to do some live interpretation of stats on the air. I'm going to bring them over here because I don't really want to show somebody's stats without permission. So, well, I mean, I, you know, he said if anybody wants to look in a public space, right? So I guess it's fine. Uh, all right, so we'll do some live stat interpretation on the air. So most played hero, Reinhardt. So... We got... I've never used this website. Everything looks so weird. So damage blocks is pretty good. Damage is pretty good as well. Where's deaths? KD ratio? Good enough. Where's death? We I mean, got a positive win ratio on this hero. So that's kind of... What the fuck is deaths? Is deaths not on here? Right after I'm talking about it being my favorite stat. Oh, you got a positive win ratio on all these heroes. Then we get down here, it's not positive. We played such a minor amount of games. I mean, I guess you could say, like, this, this isn't, like, huge variance. Like, it's a difference of, like, one fucking game and two games, right? I mean, all these stats are good. Um, not so much on Orisa. That's quite... Oh, top 69% though. Yeah. Nice job. Like, what? Why, why is deaths not on here though? That's very upsetting to me. Am I just blind? Am I stupid? Wow, that's like total deaths over here, I assume. 155 over 19 games. That's kind of high. Because... I'm trying to do division in my head real quick, and that shit's hard. I, that's quite a lot of deaths for 19 games, but I mean, I guess in one game it could have just been like a really bad game, died like 30 times or something, right? I mean, all the stats are good. You got a positive win ratio on all the heroes. Um, I may be dying too much because I'm just looking at that. But then we look at the Winston and over eight games, 43 deaths. That's pretty good, actually, especially for somebody like Winston, who's pretty aggressive. Like 251 to 43 is a pretty good ratio. Um, and I mean, you know, that's still positive, right? So that's kind of like the thing. But like dying as Reinhardt is extremely bad because if you die as Reinhardt, that's the main tank that died right there, which is not good because usually as soon as your main tank dies, everything starts to fall apart because, well, suddenly your front line's gone, isn't it? We go back, not exactly many games played in Season 9. Not exactly many games played in Season 8. Alright, so I think I've uh, pinpointed the issue here. It's actually just that we haven't really played competitive that much. Um, like, across all of Season 10, so we played 19, uh, 27... 
Like, we, yeah, no, we didn't exactly play a lot of games across all of Season 10. And then previous to that, we played even less. Um, six, so, you know, 10, 13, 16. Didn't exactly play many games previously either. So I think I've pinpointed the actual issue is probably just not playing competitive enough. Um... I mean, like, season 10 was a positive win ratio, season 9 was a positive win ratio, so logic dictates that you would actually climb if you played the game more. Um, and I mean, you know, could, like, I don't know what the dude gets up to, time and all that. Um, maybe doesn't actually have that much time to actually play the game, you know, that sucks, whatever, but like, all the stats are fine, got a positive win ratio across all the seasons there, so like, play the game more and logic dictates that you will climb because that's how math works um as long as you play consistently well which i mean based off looking at the stats it looks like it does then he or she does then as long as you play consistently well given enough time you'll climb and that's kind of how it works is it good to solo ultra mercy and valkyrie using mccree's dead eye or getting easy double kills fuck yeah it's definitely worth killing mercy out of valkyrie valkyrie is a pretty strong ultimate um, it's like a solid 7, 8 out of 10 ultimate, it's, it's pretty up there. So, and like, you kill, it's very hard to kill a Mercy in there. It's like, the big, one of the big things about Valkyrie is it's just like, well, fuck, Mercy just can't die now for a really long time. Absolutely, and you, like, bare minimum, you killed, like, their main healer, probably. Because if they got Mercy up there, that means the other healer is likely Zenyatta, or something like that. So, you killed their main healer, and you took their ultimate away as well. Deadeye is an ultimate that's difficult to use and get, like, a lot of value out of. It is almost always used just to either, like, kill a Mercy or get one or two picks really quickly and guaranteed, right? Even if you think you can shoot them, sometimes it's worth using Deadeye just to make sure that you kill those people. So, by all means, go, you fucking use Deadeye to kill that Mercy. It's absolutely worth it. Best three DPS team comms. What team comms would work with three or more DPS, for example... Bastion, Symmetra, Widow, Barissa, Diva, Mercy, Comp, and Overwatch Contenders. Um, really? They played that on Contenders? Damn. We're up to some shit over there. Um, three DPS teams. So, if we, like, the most, uh, the first example that comes to mind is just, like, a dive comp, basically. But instead of having, um, two healers or two tanks, you just put in another, another flanker. Um... This, uh, it makes the team a lot more, like, coordination-based and much less sustainable, but it does make the dive much more aggressive because you have more damage, so... The, like, so the immediate thing that comes to mind is something like Genji Tracer, Farah, Mercy, uh, Zenyatta, Winston. And, you know, you just go hard, basically. Um... Something else would be like a, a Death Ball-esque comp, but instead of an off-healer, you have Soldier. Which is not great, because you don't then have something like Zenyatta, but like... Or you could give up one of the, the tanks in the Death Ball, and then you only have like a Reinhardt or a, a Nerissa. But if you got enough DPS to pressure people away anyway, I'm sorry, bang the table then it might end up working out regardless. But, like, the most obvious example that comes to mind to me is a, is a dive comp, because that's the kind of comp that leans itself the most towards having more damage rather than utility into it. Uh, yeah, basically every comp that I run through in my mind is some variation on a dive comp. Like, you know, sometimes you got, like, uh a diva instead or you've got like reaper tracer genji something like that you know like they're ba basically every team comp example team comp i can think of is like a dive comp variant um because it just makes the most sense to me for that to be the one that has three dps that's uh, you know don't have three dps if you can avoid it um it's just one of those things that's like you know, 2 2 2 is good because it's just well rounded. No one person is completely overwhelmed. Like, you've got a main tank and an off tank, a main healer and off healer. So you've got, like, the utility that comes from a main tank and a main healer. And then you have, well, 
you have the presence that comes from a main tank and a main healer and the utility that comes from an off healer and off tank and then you have two dps which is very well rounded it doesn't take any particularly special strats to execute on everybody kind of just knows how it works because it's, it's very straightforward well-rounded kind it's the mario of team compositions right it's just you know it's perfectly well-rounded it doesn't do anything exceptionally but it doesn't do anything badly either so it's just like if you're gonna have a more unusual team composition it just kind of usually requires more coordination and teamwork to get it going than anything else and it's the sort of thing that's best done with as many people in a pre-made as possible really because teamwork and coordination synergy and all that because i mean as well as like if you have one three dps that means you're only going to have one tank or you're going to have one healer and that puts a lot of pressure on that particular aspect of the game so you need to be more ready to support that aspect right so like if you're gonna go with one healer then you want to have as many self heals on your team as possible because then the one healer is less burdened right so you maybe want to have one of your tanks be roadhog because then the roadhog can heal himself the healer doesn't really need to worry about roadhog that much um you could have soldier as one of the dps because soldier can heal himself the per don't have to worry about him that much right and if you're going to go with a one tank composition, you consider putting more flankers on it because that means your front line is going to be weaker as a result of just having less presence because you only have one tank. So if you have more flankers and on your team or he, like, you know, Genji, Tracer, Farah, Reaper, Sombra, these people don't rely on having a tank. They can just go around and do their own thing. They rarely are hanging out with their tank regardless. So only having one tank doesn't make that much difference. And because you only have one tank, it makes it much harder to advance into the enemy team because a lot of advancing into the enemy team is basically trading health for positioning. So if you've only got one tank to trade health and shields with, then that just makes it harder. But if you've got more flankers, that's diverting attention away from your front line and drawing the enemy team back, allowing your team to advance in more easily. So the example comps I can think of are basically dive comps, but like if you're if it's because you've got like your own your you've got like a pre made team that you're trying to do stuff with, then like just kind of try and figure out what works best for your team because it's the kind of thing that you sort of want to feel out like if your healer is not a particularly strong player right then you probably don't want to have the healer be the person who has to play by themselves right you'd probably want to at that point if your healer isn't the greatest player on your team you know then you'd want to have two healers but one tank instead maybe because your tank player is just more competent by himself so is is the kind of thing that you'd want to feel out with the team because i'd recommend doing that kind of thing with like a six man or a five man because you kind of want more coordination going on basically hello i've been trying to climb the diamond from high plat and i'm looking for some tips um i heard high plat was the hardest to climb out of. we were just talking about that actually yes and I'm struggling to climb myself. I can't seem to go on win streaks. Any tips and advice on how to hit diamond this season? So, it's so hard. Um, it depends on, like, what role you play more than anything else. Because, like, I didn't have that much trouble climbing because I've always played tanks and healers more than anything else. Um, I wanted to play Tracer, but... That got beat out of me when I had to play Reinhardt for so long. Um, so because I play tanks and healers, that made it easier for me because the issue I find predominantly in that S SR range is fucking people don't want to work together. They got too much ego going on and that makes it difficult to get like decent team compositions going. So if you can play a tank or a healer, then you can just like cover the gap in the team comp basically and like that's the sr range i had to like solo tank solo heal in the most so being like particularly good at those kinds of heroes is helpful because then you can cover for the fact that your team comp is bad and you've only got one of your role um uh the it's like the thing is is that 
it's very hot. The issues that I see with that particular SR range are hard to give tips for because it's kind of like person related issues, right? People are just super fucking likely to tilt. People are likely to pick stupid team compositions because I'm a fucking Widow main and I should be in Diamond. God damn it, you fucking scrubs, I'm gonna carry you. It's that kind of shit. And it's hard to really do that much about it, really. Uh, it's just one of those things where, like, as long as you play competently well, eventually you'll climb out of it. It's just that that SR is likely to be the place that takes you the longest to climb out of. But it's it's just like how math works out that you should climb eventually, because as long as you play consistently well, that means there's only five people on your team that can throw, but the enemy team has six people who can throw on it. So as long as you aren't the problem, given a large enough sample size, you'll climb. And then depending on how good you are, you know, that increases it as well. Because you... Yeah, like, if you're, like, a pro, a pro player, right, or just a very high SR player, it doesn't really work out that way. You just, like, skyrocket up the ranks really quickly. Um, I think that kind of thing gives people the wrong impression of how climbing works as well, because the examples people can look to easily for climbing are usually people who are really good at the game, and as a result, they climb extremely quickly. Most people, that won't be your experience. And, like, a lot, even if they, like, came over to the game, like, a lot of people, like, a lot of the pro players came over from other games, so they've kind of got, like, built-up knowledge already for the game. It makes the transitioning easier, and as a result, they climb quicker as well, right? Like, I think that people get the wrong idea of how climbing works, where they think that they should be in a dramatically higher SR really quickly. It's not how it works. Climbing is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And as and depending on the person, that marathon can take a really fucking long time, right? Like if you're in silver but you're actually a gold level player, that's gonna take you a long time to climb to silver from that because you're not that much better than the bracket that you're already in. So as a result, it makes the climb take longer because you are going to have less games where you have a truly exceptional performance relative to the SR. So where and Overwatch is this way, where like solo carrying is hard, right? You just have to you have to be like dramatically better than the people you're playing against to actually like climb. Um, did play on another. I mean, I got like a couple of alt accounts, and one of the accounts I played on started in. It was either very high bronze or very low silver. And I got to platinum over the course of about two days. But that's not going to be many people's experiences in those SR. It's just like, I picked Soldier, stood on the high ground, had above average aim, especially for the SR, and as a result, they didn't know what to do. They couldn't contest me. I just, they didn't know how to contest me. They didn't know that they should. Like, I'm just sitting up there shooting at people for free, so... I, as soon as they try and kill me, like, they don't know how to dive me correctly, so they don't succeed super, like, one Winston comes up by himself, I'm like, whatever. Walk into him, put the biotic field down, and he's like, whoa, 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 hold on. You're supposed to, like, panic and run away, what the fuck are you doing? Sure, and that, then he's dead, right? So, most people won't have that kind of experience. It takes, like, time to climb, so, like... The issues with this SR, it's hard to give specific tips around. It's just kind of like, as long as you're playing consistently well, you'll climb. It's just, it might take a while, particularly for that SR bracket. It is the SR that took me the longest to climb out of. Um, the first time I ever got to Masters, climbing from out of, from like, mid-plat to diamond took probably like two months. Um, and then climbing from Diamond to Masters probably took, like, three weeks. So, like, it, it's, it's, it's the worst SR. Like, ELO Hell doesn't exist because it's every ELO, but that particular stretch of ELO Hell is the worst. Anyway, far a movement. 
Can anyone point me in the right direction or recommend some mobility tips for Far? I hate to beat a dead horse, but I can't seem to have any real momentum using her. I use Concussive Blast, but it does hardly anything for me, and I'm really stiff with her. Thanks for taking the time to read. This is the hero I find that the 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 movement thing I was talking about a, a while ago. Farah is the hero I think that is the most like dramatic example between someone who is not competent on, or confident on the hero, I should say, versus someone who is very confident on the hero. Because uh, if you watch a really good Farah player like Valkia, is the example I always point to, he's so fucking smooth like he knows exactly what he's doing you just watch the dude float over and then just concussive blast like halfway across the fucking map jump into exactly the spot he wants to and then alt and kill the entire enemy team it looks fucking incredible when afara knows exactly how to move around the map so I mean, the, 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 very ob the very obvious starting point is, like, think about cover in the third dimension, because most Farah players, particularly when they're learning Farah, are just like, I'm in the sky, therefore I'm hard to hit, but they're just floating around in open space, which makes them very easy to shoot at for, like, a soldier or a McCree, especially if they're competent. So, it's, you have to think about where, what you're using as cover in the, in the sky, because you do have to use cover in the sky. So if you're playing on just like Hollywood, for example, you play around the archway and the roof on the first checkpoint for a while, right? You don't just like float over the roof and then go directly over the objective and start trying to shoot people from above. If your team is pushing in, right, and they're taking attention away from you because they're initiating a push, then you've got more freedom to go forward because like your their soldiers are getting dove, stuff like that. They can't just focus on you. So then you've got more opportunity to float across like that. But you want to avoid stuff like that. So you use, like, concussive, pla concussive Blast to try and, like, move from cover to cover. A lot of Farahs just throw it out there at the enemy for, like, whatever reason. It's better used for self-movement rather than moving the enemy team. Uh, and this is the thing with Farah. She's got two movement abilities, right? Most people don't really think of it that way. Far is super mobile because she's got one extreme vertical movement ability and one extreme horizontal movement ability, which is more than most heroes get. Right? Like, Genji gets that, but, like, he's kind of the only one, uh, Winston also, but he's a big soft boy, so, you know, he has trouble. She's got two movement abilities, so, that she she's actually super mobile. The, you gotta get used to, like, managing the fuel and everything like that, because it's one of those things where, like, you can stay in the air infinitely, but that takes an amount of resource management to you to do that correctly. So you gotta get used to stuff like that. Uh, st a starting point is like use Concussive Blast to move from cover to cover, right? So suppose we're on Hollywood and I'm playing around the roof and the archway on the first checkpoint, but I feel like I can move forward more aggressively. Something I might do is float over the roof or around the arch and then Concussive Blast off of that so that I get over to the other rooftop faster. Therefore, I'm only in open space for like half a second before I'm back behind cover again. And now I'm in a more aggressive position so I can start trying to pressure the enemy team more. Stuff like that. Um, uh, nice. What else? What else can I think of? Very broadly. Um, don't be afraid to, like, play closer to the ground, as, as weird as that might seem to say for Farah, because, like, it's... Farah does a lot of fucking burst damage, right? Like, she can kill a squishy target in two hits, which is some... Not, it's not many heroes can pull stuff like that off, so if you're really close to them... It makes it really easy to burst somebody to death. And this is where the two movement abilities comes in, to, comes in again. Because Farah does get to do cool flanking stuff. So if you can get into a position where you're like behind them and you can jump down on the enemy team from behind, like something like Gibraltar's second checkpoint is, or is really easy to do stuff like this on, right? Because you can get up behind the, on the ship so easily, like as the attacking or defending team. You, you can just like walk over the ship and then just, like, peek over the edge, like, oh, fuck, there's Anna, right? And then you just jump off the roof, hover, like, right above her, dunk, dunk, jump away, concussive blast back up onto the onto the ship again, and just like that, you assassinated the person and got away really fucking quickly. Um, 
So you like, don't be afraid to like go close to the ground because again, you do have two movement abilities. So as long as you know what you're getting yourself into and you plan it out, you can do stuff like jump on the enemy team, dunk a person really fucking quick, and then jump away again, and then concussive blast off the wall, and then bam, it's like I was never even in there to begin with. Um, uh, in general, I thought there's always like two extreme with fire players as well. They're either too aggressive, floating around in open space, like uh, just like the fucking fairground ride, getting shot at by soldiers and McCrees, or they're constantly sitting on over on their side, just like poking at the enemy team, kind of like never really accomplishing very much of anything, just kind of like poking at them over and over again. Uh, Far is one of those heroes where knowing when to flick the switch and go aggressive is an important skill. In many ways, playing Far is kind of a lot like playing Genji, where you spend time poking and prodding at the enemy team, trying to get picks if at all possible. And then there's the, like, Genji has the very clearly defined point where, like, I've built up my ultimate, so now I'm going to go super aggressively, right? Where, and so Farah is the same, but she has a less obvious tell to it. Sometimes you get to just go in and use your ultimate and be super aggressive. Like, sometimes it's very much like Genji one-to-one -one, where you poke, build up your ultimate, kill people if you can, and then make big plays with your ultimate. But Farah, as soon as you can identify that your team has the momentum... That's the time to start going more aggressively. Far is great at pushing an, a pushing an advantage forward because she herself does so much damage, right? So if you see the enemy team lose somebody, that's like the time to start playing more aggressively because now your team's got the advantage. Far is great at pushing an advantage through because she has such a big presence, right? If you see that one of their healers died, you should try and kill the other healer as quickly as possible because Far can do that really quickly and very easily especially if you are already in an aggressive position. If I'm, like, behind them on Hollywood or something like that, and I see that their main healer or off healer died, I can get on the other healer pretty quickly from that position and kill them very quickly, because it only takes two shots to kill them again. So, or if I see my team start pushing forward, like, and suddenly then I notice that, like, the soldier who was shooting at me is now occupied shooting at somebody else, now I can close the gap on the soldier and kill him very quickly. Because, like, most of the heroes that are good at killing Farah don't really like when Farah's right on top of them, right? Like, Soldier and, and uh, Widowmaker, they hate when Farah's on top of them. Like, Soldier, you know, he's got the, the, the Helix Rocket and all that, so he can kind of fend it off. But, like, if the Soldier, if the Farah gets the jump on the Soldier, she'll kill the Soldier. Because the Farah only has to hit him twice. So if you can creep up on the Widowmaker or the fo or the Soldier, or even the McCree, right? Like, McCree's scarier because you got the flashbang. But if you can creep up on those people and get the opening shot in on them, then they have so little time to react to what you're doing because you've only got to get one more shot on them, assuming you executed correctly. So it's just, Widow fucking dies. Widow's like the hardest counter in the game to fire. If you can creep up on that Widowmaker, you kill her 100 times out of 100. Because she just, there's not a lot she can do if you're right on top of her, and you already got one shot in on her. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of straight away from movement, but like, the, or, or movement specifically, but what I'm, I'm trying to illustrate is that you, there's a, you need to know when to start positioning aggressively. You need to know when you should start using concussive blasts because you need to get in on the enemy team, right? You need to be able to identify when your team has the advantage, so now I'm going to Concussive Blast over to that fucking Mercy, and I'm gonna murder her as quickly as I can. Then I'm gonna jump away from there. Like, I'm gonna, like, hover down a little bit, blast off this wall, I'm right next to Mercy, bang, bang, jump away. That kind of thing, right? Um, you gotta know when to flip the switch. And... This is the kind of thing that just kind of sort of comes with playing the hero enough is you get comfortable doing this kind of thing because uh, it's hard to know exactly how Concussive Blast is going to make you go, especially if you aren't used to using it. You don't know exactly how far you're going to go. You don't know what kind of angle you're going to take. Eventually you get used to it, right? You don't necessarily know how like jumping at the same time you blast is going to interact with it, stuff like that. It just kind of comes to you with time. Um, so... 
uh, try to use concussive blast to like jump from cover to cover, identify when you should use it to go aggressively. Don't forget you have two movement abilities, which means you can get into an aggressive position and out of an aggressive position very quickly because you are one of the heroes that has two movement abilities. So don't be afraid to do stuff like jump on the enemy team, dunk somebody, use both movement abilities to get away. Or if you think you've got a really good opportunity, don't be afraid to use like blast over into the enemy team and then just like ult right next to them, stuff like that. Um, a lot of Farah is like knowing when to go aggressive and when you need to use those abilities for survival versus when you when for when you versus when you can use them to put yourself in a better position to take advantage of the enemy team. And, you know, play the hero a lot and you'll get used to how the move, hero moves. But that's just kind of like, eh, you know, whatever. That's just, that's just heroes in general, or games in general. Getting more consistent with Widow. I would love to main Widow, but my skill changes so often. One day I'll headshot. Yeah, this is just like how human beings are. So, aim is one of those things that fluctuates between games, right? Even the greatest he player in the world, right? They aren't gonna fucking rack up 80% accuracy, headshot the enemy team games all the time, right? Aim is just something that fluctuates from game to game. Because we aren't fucking robots, right? So, no, he nobody is like 100% consistent with this kind of thing. But Widow has consistent elements to her. The most consistent element to Widow is that she's actually very strong at zoning, which is not usually talked about with Widowmaker, because zoning is basically about, like, manipulating your zone of threat so that it's most inconvenient for the enemy team, right? And it forces them into bad positions. Widowmaker has one of the most threatening zones in the game, because if you're in Widow's line of sight, she can one-shot you, right? So, and that's her entire line of sight, right? I always like to imagine your zone of threat as being, like, a circle around you, Widowmaker's is literally her entire line of sight. So hers is, and it's a very scary one as well, right? Like, it's a very scary zone because you can get one shot in it just suddenly out of nowhere. So this forces people to position around you because even if the Widow is not good, right? Like, even if you look at that Widowmaker and you think, she's trash, she doesn't hit anything, you still don't want to be in open space in front of her because she can one-shot you and even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? Like, she's gonna headshot you sooner or later. So that forces the enemy team to position in ways that are not super convenient for them. So, easy example, though not necessarily the easiest to execute on, is Temple of Anubis, right? Imagine your team is trying to push left. You're the attacking team. Imagine your team is trying to push left, right, like you usually do on the map. It, they are going to stand up on the high ground and try to shoot in on them, but they're going to start moving away from the door, closer towards the bridge, because that's just how... Uh, teams react to each other. The team that's aggressing typically starts moving the enemy team back until they can turn the momentum around. So as they start pushing up, the enemy team is going to start pushing back towards the bridge so that like, their healers and long-range DPS can get further away from the enemy team. But if you're playing Widowmaker, you take a lot of that space away from them. Because if you're standing up on the archway, suddenly standing on the open space on the high ground and the bridge is a lot scarier, and it actually forces them closer to your team, or so far away from their team that they're isolated and can't really get, like, great line of sight. So, by... by standing up on the archway, you take away space from the enemy team. Suddenly... They have to crowd in or get further away from the enemy team, which is not where they want to be, right? It either forces them closer to their team, so they're, to your team, so they're easier to kill, or just puts them into positions where they're not playing as efficiently as they could be. Um, and that's just 100% consistent, right? Because that's just like her space, like her being there physically prompts that reaction. And, you know, shooting it, shooting people accurately will reinforce that, certainly, but just her being up there prompts that kind of response because you don't want to be in open space in front of Widowmaker. Like, imagine when you play against a Widowmaker. Just think about any time you've played against a Widowmaker, right? Even if the Widowmaker was terrible, did you feel like you could comfortably just stand out in open space? The answer is almost certainly no. You didn't feel that way. So that's, like, the most consistently abusable thing about Widowmaker is that her zone of threat is so scary... Her being there prompts a reaction. So the the, the most this this ties into the consistency with Widow is finding the best angle to sit in to 
inconvenience the enemy team. Because obviously you want the best angle so that you, like, you can shoot at them, obviously. But you also want to find the angle that like forces them to do shit they don't want to do. Because they have to play around you or risk getting one shot. So you force them to stand in weird positions that they don't want to be in, and then that makes it easier to kill them. Um, another consistent element of Widowmaker is Venom Mine. This is something like, I've seen enough Widow games at this point to be like, a lot of people don't take advantage of Venom Mine. Venom Mine is basically free damage, right? Like, there's two ways you use it, either to cover for you so that you don't get crept up on, or you throw it into the enemy team to do more damage. I don't like using it as an ability to just, like, cover for you, because you can do that by looking around more or putting on a headset, right? And like, 3D sound, incredible. You can hear Genji coming. You can hear Reaper teleport behind you, stuff like that. If you throw the Venom Mine into the enemy team, that's just, like damage that happened to people and it gives you infrasight on those people as well for you not for your team for you you get infrasight on the person um <coughs> and like it makes it easier to kill people because they're taking damage from the uh venom mime so it makes it easier for you to one shot them or you know two shot them um you can see them with the infrasight which makes it easier to kill them and bare minimum if nothing else it's free ult charge right like, you just, you just did basically guarantee damage to the enemy team, so it gave you more ult charge. So, those are, like, the most consistent elements of Widowmaker you can abuse, and they are often underappreciated elements of Widowmaker. Because she's one of those heroes where people fixate on the aim. You don't need to be an exceptional... You don't need to have exceptional aim as Widowmaker to be good at her. Like, you don't need to always be uh, popping off headshots, killing the entire enemy team, right? You don't, like... Here's the other thing. You don't even necessarily need to kill the person, right? Because if, like, it's hard to get a headshot and kill somebody, right? Because the head is it's small, right? And the hero is moving around, so it's hard to get a headshot. Hitting the hero's body, however, is much easier. And if you just hit the person's body, then suddenly they're very close to being dead, right? And you can, you know, try and finish them off, that's great. If you got, like, a, widow, uh, a fucking Winston or a Genji or something like that over there, and they see you body shot the mercy and take most of her life off they go it's free real estate and they just immediately dive on the person it's so much easier for them to kill that person right conversely if you've got a genji or a winston or, or just like dive comp or whatever or a soldier or something in there doing incidental damage to people then you don't need a headshot to kill them if somebody's at like half health and you body shot them they die so and that's the other another aspect of Widow is like knowing when you like need to get the headshot to make this work or knowing you can go for the body shot. Even if you think you can go for the headshot, if you going for the body shot will get the job done, you should still go for the body shot because the body shot is just so much easier to land, right? So even if they think you can get the headshot, right? If the body shot's good, like I could headshot this boy Mercy, but she's got 50 health. Just fucking shoot her in the toe. Who gives a shit? She's dead. That's the same res result, right? That's the result we're looking for. That person's dead. It doesn't matter how we got from point A to point B. As long as the person is dead, that's the important thing. Doesn't matter how we got there. So fucking don't worry about always headshotting somebody. If shooting them in the fucking toe is going to kill the person or lead to the person dying, fucking do it. And again, if nothing else, even if you didn't kill the person, you got alt charge. So that's, there's that. Um, so that's the thing. Abuse line of sight to force the enemy team to position badly. Uh, abuse Venom Mine because it's free damage. Easy peasy. Makes it easier to pick people off for a variety of reasons and gives you alt charge. And don't always worry about getting the headshot. It's a lot easier to hit a body shot. And that's sometimes that's all you need. So there you go. God heaven, it's been almost an hour already. So this is another day we're only going to do one page. How about that? Uh, it's when I am. Some questions regarding rank play. Do you think the looking for group feature made bronze throwing groups more efficient, thus artificially inflating everyone else's SR by a tiny margin? If it did, it's by a, a truly infinitesimal amount. Like, not definitely, like, not even 100 SR. We're talking, like, if it inf inflated SR, it was by, like, a game or two. Like, not, not a huge amount. Uh, someone has the lowest SR. Dude. Do people contest for that spot? I don't know what that means exactly. 
You mean like if somebody has one SR, do they contest for that? I, I, I'm not sure on what that means exactly. Can the length of ranked matches be correlated to the time of day of a person? To the time of day a person is playing. Probably, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm not sure how exactly that would work out. Like, it's it it probably correlates one way or the other. Where like closer to prime time equals longer games or the opposite of that but like i don't know it's not like a study i've ever seen people do so i don't know i would assume like you've got like closer to prime time you've got a higher average chance of having better players around or worse players depending on your point of view um so if both teams have better players on it on average that probably means the game takes longer on average but you know, I don't exactly have numbers to work with on this one. That's just kind of like what my gut tells me. Uh, and I think about the games I've played at like fucking 5 a.m. And, like, and I'm like, yeah, they were shit shows. So, you know. Sombra's such a cool elite hacker character, but it's frowned upon if we try to, if we try the same things ourselves to the game. Yeah, don't hack the game. Like, is that... Are the same things are so like yeah don't fucking hack the game don't cheat most balanced training schedule in three weeks i'll finally get the opportunity to put lots of time into overwatch and i want to improve as much as i can it's just like a workout routine you need to do so many reps uh, so what's the best training schedule possible especially for a zero game sense feeding his brains out scrub i mean so the answer is just as much time as you possibly can uh it's not like a physical sport right like you can't physically sit there and lift weights for, until the day you die and end up fucking jacked as hell right because the human body doesn't allow that kind of thing it's not the same way it's a purely mental thing that we're trying to work on really right i mean you know there's a physical aspect because there's like muscle memory with aiming and such associated with that but it's still not like you can train this theoretically infinitely right like it's not like your body really puts much of a hard limit on this except for i need to sleep now or i might die you know you can play a long fucking time it's like what like the like korean pro players do they literally play the game like 16 hours a day like they're like fucking slaves it's, it must be a terrible existence um uh so like the, the answer is as much time as you possibly can uh but there there is an important thing to put on here is once you start getting tired or burned out at that point you playing is giving you lower results because you're not focusing as much both on playing and on improving your gameplay because that also takes mental effort as well right so once you start getting tired or burned out or frustrated and stuff like that you playing is now giving you smaller results so at that point it might be worth just taking a break right for like a couple of hours or something like that uh but as much time as you possibly can is uh, like that's the ideal is as much time as you possibly can it's not like a physical sport you can train this forever it's just based around like you burning out getting tired stuff like that but because it because you can go forever is you want to do it as much as you possibly can Especially if you want to do something like aim intensive, right? Like as much time as you can play on Widowmaker is helpful, right? Because you will, you're, you just need to build up a lot of muscle memory to be like a god aimer, right? Stuff like that. Need Moira tips. Uh, let's see. When and how to use her blink effectively? I use it for mobility mainly and to occasionally dodge a doom fist or diva bomb. So try to use it for self preservation as much as possible. A lot of Moiras like to blink around freely, just like wherever. They like to blink up to people to heal them faster, stuff like that. Don't do that. Puts you in dangerous positions, and Moira is very easy to kill when blink is on cooldown. And if you're blinking to heal somebody quicker, remember something happened to put them at low health. So you're blinking up to the thing that put that person in low health to try and save the person. Don't do stuff like that. Try to just use it for self-preservation if as much as possible. You can fade forward aggressively, certainly, and I, I do it. It's not like you never do this. You can take this advice too far the other way and never use it aggressively. Like, you do want to use it aggressively sometimes, but you are typically looking to use it defensively. Uh, just because you're so you're so easy to kill when, bla when, blink, uh, when fade is on cooldown. When to play aggressive. I chase a lot and I don't get killed because of that, but I feel it's a bad habit. 
fade gives you a pretty big buffer like it's a really good movement ability right so if you end up chasing somebody down but you have fade fade gets you back pretty quickly and then you have the healing orb as well for an extra buffer on the other end so you can play pretty aggressively and not get punished for it particularly if you're playing in like uh mid to low sr where people are not great at killing people uh time to kill in low sr is dramatically higher than at low than at uh, the higher ends of sr so like you can get away with it pretty easily on moira so if you see an opportunity to play aggressively take it like we said earlier play aggress as aggressively as you possibly can and then when you get punished for it just recognize hey i got punished here all right let's not do that next time when to play a healer and if it's better to stick with the team or flank a little no never do that never flank uh never flank as moira she's just not good at it like just think about it, like just like pure mathematical side think about how long it takes moira to kill somebody right right click does 50 damage per second if you're trying to kill a 200 health hero it takes you four seconds to kill that person that's a long fucking time i mean you know you got the damage orb as well which makes it a little bit higher you can melee them at the lot at the end to try and like burst down the last little bit so it doesn't equate up to four seconds but like like baseline moira killing somebody takes four seconds that's a long ass time that's a now, if it took a fucking, if a Tracer blinked up to you and it took Tracer four seconds to kill you, shit, Tracer fucked up to do that, right? Like, Moira's not good at killing people quickly, she's not good at getting in positions, she's not good at surviving when she gets into that position, and she's not good when pe good at people turning around on her, right? Like, this is part of it, is that Tracer and Genji can stay around behind the enemy team because they are so mobile and so hard to kill. Moira, when Fate is on cooldown, is very easy to kill. And if her orb is on cooldown, she's even easier to kill. So, don't flank as Moira, ever. It's never the correct play. It's not never the correct play. There's like a like fucking before somebody comes at me like, oh, in 1% of the situations, this is the correct play. It is almost never the correct play. Don't flank on Moira. It's bad. Don't do it. Uh, and when to use orbs and which ones. So, you want to use the damage orb as much as you can because it builds alt charge so which is it's used predominantly in a similar way to uh fire strike where you're using it to build ultimate you'll want to use the damage orb as much as is physically possible because it's just the better orb um but oh fuck that oh um you want to use the damage orb as much as possible but there are times to use the healing orb which is I need this person to stay alive, so I'm going to use the healing orb as well, because then I'll be healing an insane amount onto that person, right? Moira does a lot of healing. So if you need somebody to stay alive, you use the healing orb to try and keep them alive. Uh, if they're in a dangerous position that you don't think you can safely go to, throw the healing orb at them, because the healing orb can't fucking die. So just throw it at them. And, like, don't fade up to the person who's dying. Stuff like that, right? Throw the healing orb at them instead, right? Let that deal with it. Now, the healing orb does a lot of... It's 75 health per second. If it, a person is savable, that's probably good enough. And you didn't have to expose yourself to do that. Um, similarly, if, like, there's a fight happening on both sides of the objective, you can throw the healing orb at one side of the fight, and then you can heal the other side of the fight, right? Because, like... So this happens on places like Hollywood, where sometimes half the team goes back, half the team goes front. You can't really just like go between the enemy team freely, so you can just throw the healing orb at one side of the fight to take care of that side. Um, and like, but like the main reason I use the healing orb is because I need to regenerate my resource, right? Because if I've just held left click over the enemy team for a while, or, or left click over my team for a while rather, I'm low on resource. I'm, if I'm at like half or below that. I'll throw the healing orb at my team because that'll take care of my team for a while right? if they need healing, right? If, they, if they're if they all full health, doesn't matter, right? But if people still need healing on my team, like there's a fight still actively happening and I'm running low on resource, I'll throw the healing orb at my team, like take care of that for a second and then I'll go away and suck the enemy team for a while because my orb is taking care of my team. So I can just go over here, do this for a little while, regenerate my resource and then, hey, I was still healing while doing damage, building more L charge, and refreshed my resource while my team was at no risk. So that's cool. Uh, those are like the main reasons is like healing somebody who's in a dangerous position or like just like a bunch of people are grouped together and you need to heal them, right? Like, and your team is a, a cluster team fights happening, throw the, throw the orb through them, spray over them, whole team getting a lot of fucking health right now, that kind of thing. So those are like the main reasons to use the orbs, but you do want to use the damage orb as much as possible. Worth pointing out though, 
once you have your ultimate, throwing the damage orb doesn't really do that much anymore. Because it's not exactly likely to kill somebody, right? It does increase your chances of killing somebody, but not by a dramatic amount. The main reason to, do, to throw the damage orb is it gives you ult charge. So once you have your ultimate, you don't need to throw the damage orb so much anymore. At that point, you can hold the orb cooldown more to use either a healing orb because you need it, or you see an opportunity to kill somebody so you can throw the damage orb at them. So when you're building alt, use the damage orb as much as you can, unless you need the healing orb for one of the other previously outlined reasons. Once you have your ultimate, sit on the orb cooldown more, just because then you can use it to try and kill somebody, or you can use the healing orb when you really need it, right? And you, with Moira, you're looking to use your ult as much as possible anyway, so you'll still be looking to use your damage orb as much as possible throughout the game. But once you have your ultimate, you don't need to use the damage orb so much anymore, because the main reason to throwing it constantly has already been met. I have my ult now, so I don't need to keep throwing it regularly. Uh, ways to reduce impret lag. I'm not technically minded enough to know that kind of thing. When defending on a payload map, stay in the direction that the payload is moving. Yeah, like don't go behind the defend the attacking team is typically good advice, yes. Uh, best Anna YouTube guide? Uh, on average, the best one you'll be able to look at is like uh, Jane's videos. Um, is it Jane or Janey? I'm not sure. Uh, that dude, J-A-Y-N-E. Dude's really smart. Um, knows what he's talking about. He's a lot smarter than me. Uh, he's the best one to look to for that kind of thing, really. Uh, also, the other one I li like, the two Overwatch, uh, educative, uh, Overwatch content people I watch are Jane and One Amongst Many. Both very smart men, both know a lot more about the game than me, um, but they're not as funny as me. <laughs> so, uh, but they're the best ones to go to. They, they're very smart people. And, or, or me, you know, I'm here also, but I don't have a guide for Anna, strictly speaking. Not, not that they do, but yeah, their videos are so long. You go watch a fucking One Amongst Many video, it's like two hours long. Fucking. And people say my content's long. Anyway, but he's very smart, so whatever. So uh, that's it was fucking hour, 10 minutes. Great job. I only did one page. Fucking that's the kind of video we made today. So thank you very much for watching. If you did, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm more than happy to answer. If you haven't already, you can join our Discord and ask questions more directly and have a conversation about them or just shitpost with us. And I hope you found the video helpful.